ripe for deception. In Acts 2, Jesus, uh, or the, Peter is preaching the first gospel sermon here regarding Jesus, a man attested to you with miracles and wonders and signs. He's not just up making empty claims. God attested to the fact he was telling the truth with the miracles. Now, the idea that you have to have miracles, that is, uh, or at least speaking in tongues, the idea of some, in order to be a good Christian, and if you're a really man of God, then this is what you have to do. And that's just evidence that uh, God approves you. Well, that's kind of the idea that was being refuted at Corinth, and Paul was saying, no, no, no. Some of you get the gift of tongues, some of you have other gifts, and some of good Christians don't have that gift. Uh, a lot of people had the Holy Spirit, and it's not the equivalent of speaking in tongues. Uh, that's a mindset that I need to continue. It, 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 speaking in tongues, Holy Spirit, that's just kind of synonymous. Christ had the Spirit without measure. Did he speak in tongues? Did you think about that? Not once that I know of, or that the Bible reveals. John the Baptist had the Holy Spirit. He did not speak in tongues. Elizabeth, uh, Zacharias, Simeon were men who were, and women who were faithful to God, who were full of the Holy Spirit, according to Scripture. They didn't speak in tongues. The apostles, uh, before Pentecost, had gifts of the Holy Spirit. They performed miracles, uh, but they didn't speak in tongues before Pentecost. Those on Pentecost did not speak in tongues. Now, that's news to a lot of people. But verse 7 says all that spoke were Galileans. And, of course, the apostles were from Galilee. The Holy Spirit fell on them. Pentecostals, <laughs> the people on the day of Pentecost, were from every nation under heaven. But the ones that spoke in tongues were from Galilee. Some of the Corinthians spoke in tongues. Some of them did not speak in tongues. And the Romans did not speak in tongues, though they were a faithful church. And Paul hoped to come to them so that they could receive gifts through the laying on the hands of the apostles. So it's not in the role that a lot of people imagine. It's not necessarily uh, a critical part of your life. If you don't speak in tongues, <laughs> Well, you don't today because that ceased according to Paul's promise. Glossolalia is the word that is used today to refer to speaking in tongues. It's a combination of Greek words uh, that refers to the gift of tongues. But what passes as the gift of tongues today is not the speaking in tongues we read about in the New Testament. One of the most obvious ways, just short circuit Paul's clear explanation that we talked about last time, that they would cease and when they would cease, with the fact that what is called tongues today, glossolalia, uh, if this is speaking in tongues, would be confirming all kinds of false doctrines because people who speak in tongues teach all kinds of different conflicting, contradictory doctrines. Now that's just an obvious point that I don't know anybody trying to answer. Uh, it was to confirm the word. You can't deny that. And if it confirms what's being taught by those who speak quote, speak in tongues today. It's confirming lies. And we know that's not true. It's taught by, it was practiced by the Gnostics in John's day, history tells us, certainly by the pagans, by Mormons, Catholics, Quakers, Shakers, Seventh-day Adventists, Jehovah's Witnesses, Christian Scientists, the Worldwide Church of God, and Pentecostals. Now, if you know anything about religion in the United States, you know that's not the same thing. They speak contradictory doctrines, but groups of these, all of these, 
proclaim glossolalia and practice glossolalia. And that's just not possible that it is confirmed as the Holy Spirit. United Pentecostals, for example, believe there's one in the Godhead. The Congregational Holiness Pentecostals believe there's three in the Godhead. Both of them are confirmed because they all speak in tongues. Well, they all practice glossolalia, which I don't believe is the speaking in tongues of the New Testament. United Pentecostals teach that baptism is essential for salvation. The International Church of the Four Square Gospel teaches you're saved by faith only without baptism. Now, that's pretty different. What do you do to be saved? Here's one answer. Here's another answer. And it's all being confirmed by the Holy Spirit, according to their claim. And that's a foolish claim. Church of Christ's Holiness says baptism is by immersion only. Church of Emmanuel says it's by sprinkling or immersion. Make your choice. That's different, contradicting each other. What about the ordinances of the church? This is supposed to be guided by the Holy Spirit and confirmed by the Holy Spirit because they speak in tongues. They're called, uh, they're called tongues. The Church of Jesus Christ of Apostolic Faith has in their you know, manual ordinances, foot washing and the Lord's Supper. Those are the two ordinances. So you go to the assemblies of God, they say, no, it's the Lord's Supper and baptism. Both of them say this is confirmed by the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Congregational Holiness say the ordinances are baptism, the Lord's Supper, and foot washing. The, quote, original Church of God says, no, the ordinances are baptism, tithing, free will offering, the Lord's Supper, foot washing. And the New Apostolic Church of North America says it's baptism, Holy Communion, and Holy Seeing. Now, whatever that is, that's and it's all confirmed. They're all practicing glossolalia, and it's confirming the word, and they're just teaching all kinds of things that are different. We have some Pentecostals who believe that Sunday is the Sabbath, and some that believe Saturday is the Sabbath, and they all speak in tongues, or they all practice glossolalia. Some say tongue speaking is necessary. Some say it's not necessary. Some say you wear jewelry and makeup, and some say, no, you don't wear jewelry and makeup. And they're all practicing glossolalia. Some say you can use doctors in medicine. Some say, no, you cannot. And they all are confirming the word they claim. Glossolalia, that claims to be speaking in tongues, confirms false doctrine. Therefore, I know that's not the speaking in tongues of the New Testament which confirmed the truth. Now, that's just simple, obvious, and I believe absolutely unanswerable. There were real gifts that were given to confirm the word, and they were given for a limited time, as we pointed out last time. It was bestowed through the apostles' hands, which Simon saw clearly and wanted to buy. Not just the gift, but the gift of conferring, laying on hands so that it could be confirmed, which is not being done today, by the way. Uh, he wanted to buy that. Peter said, it's none of your business. This belongs to the apostles. Paul said very plainly in 1 Corinthians 13, these gifts of prophecy of tongues will cease. And then he told us when, when the completed, perfect revelation came, then you wouldn't need the partial that was in the process of being revealed at that time. Now that's, I think, enough for somebody who's really interested in truth and certain and knowing that truth is harmonious. Um, there's a huge problem that I don't believe they can start to answer. It's a very obvious phenomenon, and it's impressive to a lot of people because they, it, it just kind of takes over, and it's not really them doing this. This is a real a traumatic experience, and yes, I, I would agree with that. 
I think we can understand what it is. And there are many scholars who have studied it in great detail, which is often ignored by people who just go on to their feelings. Notice the statement by Iron Martin, uh, who is writing here in his doctoral dissertation. He says, the nature of glossolalia is therefore frenzied, inarticulate jargon with a sprinkling of coherent ejaculations. It just sounds like language, but if you listen to it, it language experts, uh, which you know, this fellow is getting his doctorate in linguistics, this is not language. Whole inflections, tonal qualities have the characteristics of speech, but it's not speech. Uh, William Weems, professor of African language, UCLA, noted that they were speaking in tongues in Africa, and they do in the South, and they do in the North in the United States, and it's different because they have different uh, intonations uh, in their but they're all doing the same kind of thing in that it's just inarticulate jargon. I must report without reservation that my sample does not sound like a language structurally. There can be no more than two conflicting vowel sounds and a most peculiarly restricted set of consonant sounds. These combine into very few syllable clusters which recur many times in various orders. The consonants and vowels do not sound like English, the speaker's native language, uh, but the intonation patterns are so completely American, English, that the total effect is a bit ludicrous. It's different sounds, but the same intonation patterns. Uh, Eugene Nydia, the American Bible Society, uh, which is an organization responsible for putting the Bible in all kinds of languages around the world expert in language. The types of inventory and distribution would indicate clearly that this recording, and it was a recording that they had uh, compiled several different instances of so-called glossolalia for study, bears no resemblance to any actual language which has ever been treated by linguists. Now, she's not a novice in that area. On the basis of what I've learned about this type of phenomena, or tongues, in other parts of the world. Apparently, there's the same tendency to employ one's own inventory of sounds in nonsense combinations, but with simulated foreign features. Now, understanding the scholars who have studied this claims that it's a language uh, are not really honest. I think the people know better. In the New Testament, the gifts, the gift of tongues was a real language. Notice the description in Acts 2. In Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And this is the point. How do you communicate to people from every nation under heaven? Well, they heard and they understood and were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. Now, they're from every nation under heaven, and they're hearing them speak in their own language. Now, just you know, what, what is he saying here? Because they all heard gibberish and were impressed with it. No, they understood, their, they were from every nation under heaven, they understood in their own language. How is it that we hear them in our own language to which we were born? They were hearing and understanding in their own language. Now, that's not what's going on today. Some may claim that, but it's not the case. Continues in verse 9. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, districts of Libya, around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans, Arabs. How many live her languages? They never studied Egyptian. They never studied <laughs> Italian. All over the place. And here are these ignorant fishermen who hadn't been out of that area. 
were communicating effectively and they were hearing it in their own language. We hear them in our own tongues speaking. Now, I don't think you have to be brilliant or have a PhD in order to understand this was a language that they were hearing. It is not the wild-eyed gibberish that passes for speaking in tongues today. The inspired definition is from Acts 2, people from every nation under heaven heard them speak in his own language, the language to which we were born, in our own tongues, are phrases that define clearly what this was and what passes as glossolalia today, uh, what is glossolalia today is not this. In 1 Corinthians 14, the Apostle Paul, reasoning with them about the gifts that they were exercising, and they were doing so without interpreters, which was not edifying, and so he rebukes them for it. There are perhaps a great many kinds of languages in the world. We understand what he's talking about, right? And no kind is without meaning. Then if I do not know the meaning of the language. I shall be the one who speaks like a barbarian. The one who speaks will be a barbarian to me. You just sounding like what they sound like today. Crazy. A barbarian. Right on, oh, nobody. They were effectively doing that at Corinth in that they were doing it without an interpreter. In the middle of Greece, they were standing up and speaking in Italian. And nobody there understood. Well, that's not what you, you don't do it without an interpreter, and that's the rebuke here, first one. But the language had meaning, and you're supposed to understand it. It's supposed to edify. Therefore, let the one who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. And if there's no interpreter, keep silent, he says. Now, interpret sometimes translated, translate. Uh, that's what you do to a real language. It's the same word that we find in Hebrews chapter 7. This Melchizedek was of all by the translation of his name, king of righteousness. Interpret, translate, same word. Uh, it's the idea clearly communicated in 1 Corinthians 14, 21, in the law is written by men of strange tongues for the lips of strangers. I will speak to this people. And he's talking about the Romans who would come and destroy Jerusalem. Uh, he quotes the law, which predicted if you don't do what I'm telling you, men by, <laughs> who speak strange tongues, you don't understand Italian. Here comes the, the, the Roman army, and they're going to destroy it. Um, we know what he's talking about here. Now, let's summarize this. The point that I'm making is what is practiced today as glossolalia is not the gift that Corinthians practiced or that was practiced on the day of Pentecost. Pentecostals are not following the example of the Pentecostals of the New Testament. What they practice today is not the same. They were real tongues or languages. They were spontaneous. The signs were presented in order to confirm them. The word was scripture, and actually what they were speaking in languages they hadn't studied, and people confirming that it was a language from another country was a sign. Uh, that word was inspired they taught you believed, you repent, and you baptized, you were saved. And it was a language. The spirit was subject to those who were practicing these gifts and says, you shut up if there's no interpreter. Uh, you do it one at a time. And he plainly says the spirit would be subject to the, the ones who were speaking. They were to be silent without the interpreter. The women were to be silent and they were to speak one at a time. Now that's what the Bible says about the real tongues. 
the fake tongues, they have to prepare and you can take classes on how to do this and how you get yourself going so that this thing takes over. Uh, you say, we're going to sign proof. Well, we don't believe in that. Uh, their word contradicts scripture. They teach you believe and you're saved, then baptized, which is not what the Bible teaches. The language is not language, it's unintelligible. Even the leading linguistic experts in the world say it's not intelligible. They say they can't control. Uh, they're to be silent without an interpreter. They speak whether there's an interpreter or not. Women are to be silent. Uh, women shout one at a time. Most of the assemblies, they're all shouting at the same time. Now, I don't think you have to be really brilliant to look at that and say, this is not the same thing. And if that's the case, then there's fraud going on. And indeed, I believe that's exactly the case. It, it is exciting. It attracts a lot of people. It feels good. It's not what you see in the Testament. It's interesting to notice, as several of the linguistics experts mentioned, that the glossolalia as practiced today is not unique to Christianity. We see it practiced by a number of different religions. Here from Babel magazine, which is a magazine that you've heard of the, the language uh, lessons you can get from Babel that teach people foreign languages. Uh, very effective language learning mechanism, but they have a magazine each month that keeps up to date with what's going on. They point out glossolalia is very common in Pentecostal Christian worship services, but it has also occurred in other sects of Christianity as well as other religions and cults such as paganism, shamanism, and Japan's God's Light Association, which they're known for. <laughs> they're speaking in tongues. Continues. The reality is that it's just a string of meaningless sounds. Now, these are people who are experts in languages. They have courses to learn most of the languages uh, spoken around the world. Research conducted by linguist William J. Sharman from the University of Toronto suggests that while glossolalia is gibberish, it does resemble human language certain ways, such as use of intonation, rhythm, pauses, separate groups of syllables. But when uh, Samarin asked a group of students to invent an artificial language on the spot, they came up with, what they came up with was very similar to glossolalia, leading him to the conclusion that it, it is an invented language that anyone can produce. Uh, and there have been several studies at UCLA where it was reproduced in the classroom by people who were not believers at all, but they went to try to speak in tongues and got to the point where it was just coming out without their control. Um, it's not unlike hypnotism, but it is, and I don't have time to go into all of the research, but there's been a great deal done, and we know exactly what's happening. Uh, Donald Burdick, in his book, Tongues to Speak or Not to Speak, who is a linguist, says the survey has shown that speaking in tongues is widespread and very ancient. Indeed, it's probably as long as man has had divination, curing sorcery, propitiation of spirits, he has had causal uh, The oracle at Delphi was a very famous uh, place where women would... Uh, Actually, they were using drugs, but going to trances, and they, they had all kinds of speaking in tongues, uh, and that is described in the Greek histories in detail. Uh, whatever the explanation, he says, it's clear that pagans as well as Christians have their glossolalia experiences. And Christians, I would put with quotation marks. Uh, George Kooten, who's a psychologist, former president of Colby, talks about the phenomenon when he says, whatever may be predicted of the psychological condition of speaking with tongues in the New Testament, it's 
evident that the experience since then may be classified as ecstasy or allied phenomena. These are technical terms that psychologists use. In ecstasy, there is a condition of emotional exaltation in which the one who experiences it is more or less oblivious to the external world. And they done technical experiments so that they measure what's going on in the brain when you're speaking. Certain parts of your brain light up, as it were, in their experiments. Uh, that goes to sleep when you're speaking in tongues, the conscious part of it, and another part lights up. Um, loses, to some extent, his self-consciousness and power of rational thought and self-control. Um, continuing here, uh, ecstasy, catalepsy, mass hysteria, a psychological state in which the conscious controlling apparatus of the mind is not dominant. A state in which speech continues after thought is exhausted in a series of meaningless syllables result. Um, Sigmund Freud got a lot of things right, but he did learn a number of things that helped us. Uh, disturbances of speech may give very delicate indications of internal turmoil of personality. Freudian O's great linguistic gift. Now, this was one, uh, Anna O, one of the more famous patients, and if you study Freud, you have to know all about this. But she spoke in tongues. She had a linguistic gift, as referred to, perhaps the most interesting example of hysterical aphrasia or paraphrasia. Um, we know a lot about this, it's not mysterious. And it's been studied, and it's just worlds apart from the evidence to confirm the word of someone who hasn't studied the language speaking that foreign language. Patterson, American uh, Scientific Association, writing in the journal, says several linguistic studies, including our own, suggest glossolalia, glossolalias develop their glossolalic speech from ill-formed structure to practiced and polished glossolalic speech. They're not too good at it when they start, but they get better once they practice. The linguistic qualities of the glossolalia depend to some extent on the stage of development of the glossolalia. I don't think that was the case with the apostles. <laughs> they did it right the first time. They didn't have to practice that foolishly. He continues, glossolalia has specific linguistic structures based on the language or tongue of the speaker. That linguistic organization is limited to the capacity to speak in this type of semi-organized language can be replicated under experimental conditions. He goes on to describe the experiments there at UCLA. Glossolalia has specific linguistic structure based on the language of speech. Can be replicated. <coughs> Scripture was being revealed. It has been revealed. They did not have Acts 2.38 to turn to. They were revealing that word and then confirming it with the signs that followed, whether it was speaking in tongues or drinking deadly poison or handling serpents. Uh, these things were miraculous and obvious to the people who saw it that said, these people are from God. You hear glossolalia today, people say, these people, as Paul pointed, how we're barbarians. Uh, this is just an articulate jargon. Uh, that's not the same effect. Scripture today is given by inspiration of God and is confirmed by these signs that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped. It thoroughly equips us to see this is not, that is, Glossolalia is not what we read about in the New Testament. Yes, we read miraculous signs, but they are obvious signs that proved supernatural origin, not barbarianism. Uh, looking at uh, the lessons on the Holy Spirit, we talked about fundamentals. We talked about the, the fact that the Holy Spirit is not a ghost. He is a person who can talk, doesn't need to communicate with messages and urges and tingles. He can speak explicitly, Paul says, and does, and does so perfectly and completely. In conversion, it always is indirect, 
never on the individual operating on the preacher providing information that the person then responds to. The Holy Spirit guides and people listen uh, to the sword of the Spirit. The miraculous gifts were to confirm the revelation of the Holy Spirit. And glossolalia was one of those signs and what's called glossolalia today or speaking in tongues but not anything like what we see in the New Testament. These lessons, I think, should help us understand that we have a wonderful blessing, a gift, to be guided by divine information from one of the members of the Godhead, that the Spirit and the Son and the Father were all at creation and have been working since then, and today we can that Holy Spirit is watching and listening when we don't pay attention to what he says. We appreciate your studying with us and you can go back and uh, review these lessons in the archive, have others perhaps tune in and study these points if you'd like an outline of the lesson. We have one for each of uh, the lessons that you can get and I think they will be online. It's online. Well. It, it's on it's on the Facebook page now. It's on the Facebook page now if you want the outline for the lesson each of the lessons I believe. Thank you for listening this evening. We appreciate your studying with us. We encourage you to study with us Sunday morning. Let's conclude with a word of prayer. We're thankful, Father, that we're guided so perfectly and so completely. Help us, Father, to humbly submit to the revelation of the Holy Spirit that we can grow to be more and more like you, that we can be transformed into your image as we follow the supernatural guiding by the words of the Holy Spirit. We're so thankful for the message. Help us to show that as to it. In our Savior's name we pray. Amen.